All right. Okay. So this one's an exciting episode. I'm excited to go into this. We are here with Mr. Kenneth Godley. Mr. That's right. <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend. Today we are talking about his uh, $39,000 wholesale contract that he just closed last week. We're going to get down into the nitty gritty, how he found the deal, how he worked the deal, some of the problems that arose along the way. And we want to answer your questions about this deal and how he looks at deals. Uh, through this episode. Okay, okay. So uh, some people have already seen you in some photos here and there, but we haven't done some official video work. So uh, tell them, who, who are you? Kenneth, who's Kenneth? Kenneth is just a regular guy, just like anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, in all seriousness, my name is Kenneth Godley. Uh, I am a native San Antonian. Uh, so I, not too many, there are not too many corners of this city that I don't know. Um, just real briefly, um, I actually purchased, or I should say we, um, our company, which by the way is Nest Egg Real Estate Investments, uh, we purchased our uh, first project from Hillco Homes. Um, up top, man, up top. <laughs> one of the things that I like about Hillco Homes is that even though we purchased that first property, we were always able to maintain a relationship. Marco here, anytime I had any questions or anything like that, uh, he answered them for me and guide me, guided me or us. Uh, when I say us, I mean my business partner and I, as much as, as uh, pretty much as much as we needed, and we've kind of just made. And you made money on that deal. Yes, we made money on that deal. It came in <laughs> under budget, <laughs> and we sold it for more than what the ARV was. So, talk about a win-win. <laughs> that how, how long ago was that? About a year or so. About a year or so ago, maybe. No, was it? Yes, yeah, about a year, right in about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And that was y'all's first investment property, that right? That was our first investment property. We did a flip, uh, and uh, um, we had, of course, we had our challenges just like anybody else. But again, though, that project came in under budget, and we sold it for more than what the ARV was. All right. And we actually, uh, we did a pretty nice flip on it, too, so. Excellent. Yeah, that, that was a total transformation. That house needed some work. Yes. You made it happen. Okay. So <clears throat> about a year ago, you bought your first investment property. You were an investor, knew nothing about Hilco, but then you found this deal just so happened. That was the beginning of the Hilco Homes relationship with you. Mm -hmm. You had done some deals since then. Mm -hmm. And then recently, about how long ago? I guess about six months ago. Actually, it was longer than that when you first called me um, and um, said, let's have a conversation. Uh, and I put it off and put it off, and then I, you know, I finally I called you back and said, "Hey, let's have a conversation." And it was about me. I had to go through your assistant. <laughs> I remember that. That was that was a hard one. And it was about me joining the uh, Hilco Homes team. Uh, and my main motivation was, let me tell you guys something. Everybody watching this, this guy is really smart. He knows a lot. If you have any type of relationship with him. Uh, he's going to help you, and he knows a lot. Really, really smart. I've learned more than I thought I could possibly learn just coming to work for him. So, well, I'm smart enough to have you tricked uh, <laughs> in that regard. But yeah, so I, I thought it was really exciting. I remember when we first did the deal, or, or uh, the deal about a year ago. We walked through it. We looked at it. We also talked about the rehab and kind of. We were talking about how the lending was getting in place, and you know there was a lot uh, to do that. And we we wanted to set you up for success, and it turned out that way. Then uh, some time went by, about six months ago, give or take, and we started conversations about you joining the Hilco Homes team. Mm -hmm. And so now you are officially an acquisition partner. You're on our team. You're always looking for deals. You're contracting with sellers. You're selling our contracts to buyers, and you're just kind of doing a little bit of everything at this point. What was the kind of the motivation? Because you started as an investor, and then you've incorporated the wholesaling component. It's a it's a majority of your time now at this point. Mm -hmm. 
uh, what was kind of the motivation in that regard? What was the purpose or what was the reason that wholesaling allured you in? Well, wholesaling um, is an opportunity, of course, you know, and it pays the bills, you know, right. uh, and, and it's a way to, you know, generate uh, uh, cash flow, generate income while looking for uh, properties for, for our own personal investment. Um, but the main motivation for me for coming here was because I knew just from watching your videos, conversations with you, uh, that you knew you probably had forgotten more about real estate than I knew. And that was my main motivation was to learn, learn, learn. Uh, I'm a lifelong learner, so uh, anything that I can do to, you know, learn, I I'm with it. And that was the that was the main motivation. Well, you wanted to learn so you can incorporate what you learned into your investing business and become more proficient as an investor. Yes. Awesome. So, and as an investor, your goal is um, you'll do flips, but your main goal is to get cash flowing properties, right? Right. Awesome. Uh, in fact, we had this conversation. Was it last week? Yeah, about awesome. creating a passive income. So just a little bit about the direction that we're moving in is we are in the process of securing private lenders. Uh, and Anyone so watching, can, by the way? Yeah, anybody watching? We, we're looking for private lenders. <laughs> Nestig Real Estate Investments. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, you know, we're looking to go ahead and just begin building our portfolio uh, with uh, several uh, buy and hold properties. Um, just, I think, probably within the next... I want to say 12 to 18 months. Hopefully, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 15, 20 properties generating positive cash flow. Awesome. So again, we are going to go into Kenneth's uh, deal here. We're going to go into the specifics. This is a big deal. Um, but before we do that, we want to remind you: this is the Ask Wholesale Show. It's live. So the whole purpose we're doing this is we want to answer your questions. We want to make sure that we can answer any questions you might have generally about investing, about wholesaling. We're wholesalers, um, whether it's marketing, lead gen, negotiation, you have a problem with a particular property, contracts, any of those items. But even more so, this is a real life example, or even a case study as an example, that you can ask specific questions about his deal. So this needs to be a two-way communication. So. I uh, know we have a few people watching. Ask us your questions. We want to give you true value. So what we got? Um, oh, so Robin is sharing. But I wanted to say, you know, this is an exciting $39,000 deal. And I wanted to ask, as an outsider, oh, dang, he's over here. what he's are cutting the, the line over here? On that. What <laughs> are the things that don't, like, how close was it to not happening? Like, what would have had to have happened for it not to happen? Because a $39,000 wholesale deal to me, as an outsider, it seems pretty. I know everybody shows those little. By the way, your your mic. Do you mind trying to fix it? It's um, be, be careful. Don't hit it. <laughs> we might have to have. We need to, I it. turned his mic off for a second there. It was getting a little little wild over here. But yeah, like I think that's an like um, I think it's really important to talk about like how that maybe would not have happened, right? You know, because that's, that's a big deal, 39000 I mean, unless that's like an everyday thing. It's nope. definitely, so I know people who don't make $39,000 in a year. Like, I was a teacher, and I barely made that in a year as a teacher, man. So this <laughs> deal for Hilco Homes as a company is the biggest deal that Hilco, Hilco Homes in one company has done. We've always kind of focused more on the volume side of things, and rather than trying to get the biggest fees uh, possible. We're always trying to get good deals for our investors and make sure you know the seller too can walk away with a good amount of money. So we're not trying to like knock oh, home runs all the say time. Say hello to Canuck Mashulam. I like your Canuck. Name. Hey man, thank Is you for new? watching. Yeah, he's Canuck. new. He's Welcome, Canuck. New, new ask lifelong, lifelong watcher new now. New lifelong <laughs> watcher. Make sure you ask Kenneth, because Kenneth is also new on the show. Maybe you'll be here in the show in a couple months with your first $39,000 right. deal. All right. So, but this was uh, the biggest one the company has uh, closed. We focus more on volume, and Kenneth has done it. So, uh, let's kind of get into it because um, I'm sure people are eager again ask questions. Um, to how did the, where did this deal come from? What how did it occur? And I can jump in too. Please do. Uh, <laughs> no, um, how this deal came about is that it was an old company lead uh, that uh, someone else was working. Uh, and just for whatever reason, from what I understand, there were a lot of challenges uh, in the beginning 
uh, with this deal as far as who was in title, who actually owned the home, just a whole bunch of different uh, uh, things that got in the way. Um, and then from what I understand, all of a sudden, that there was just zero contact with the sellers. Um, so here, I'll jump in. Okay. So um, Hilco Homes, we have a team. There's actually 11 of us now. And you'll be seeing more videos of Kenneth and the team and those type of things. But there's a large team. Everybody does a little bit uh, different activity. But the main core of us are what we call acquisition partners like Kenneth who are always looking for deals. Well, another acquisition partner had uh, done some driving for dollars, sent out some letters, which is a very common strategy. And through the letters they sent out, uh, when they, by the way, when they dri were driving for dollars, they skip traced to find the owner. They sent out some letters, the owner or the person that received the letter, who was the owner in the situation, called in and said they were interested in selling. They were even unsure about this house uh, they didn't even knew, know they owned the house, but they were cool with selling it because they were going to be making some money. So we're like, all right, we'll write up a contract. We did that. Well, as we went through the title process, it turned out the person we were talking to wasn't the owner, but had the exact same name as the owner and even ha had like a husband that had the exact same name or something crazy like that. It was crazy. But we found out that they weren't the owner. Eventually, by going to the property, because at this point we thought we were under contract, we were showing it, turned out that the real owner uh, lived nearby and they didn't want to sell the house. So at this point, this house was just kind of on a late follow-up sequence, like once a month, once every two months. And then that's when Kenneth came in and then you saw the lead. Mm -hmm. And then I saw the lead and I called him back uh, and the lady who I had spoken to uh, because apparently when we first started doing this deal uh, with the other acquisition partner, um, he was talking with someone completely and totally different. From what I understand, uh, this person, um, they were no longer involved in the process. Uh, and so... The person that said no. The person that said no. Right. Actually what had happened was, uh, no, that's not, exact, that's not quite how it went. It's not how I remember it. They had said yes, but then something happened where all communication just stopped. Because like you they said- They stopped answering our calls? Mm -hmm. Yes, they stopped oh, okay. answering our calls mm -hmm. because like you said, uh, um, we had a contract and everything. So mm -hmm. at some point, somebody said yes. Mm -hmm. you know, but all communication had stopped. Uh, um, and um, you know, fast forward, I, I, make, I reestablished communication with uh, the seller, the person who ended up being the seller on the property. By the way, really quick. So this deal closed about a week ago. How long ago, how long was this process when you made this initial phone call? Um, I want to say probably, oh, that's a good question. I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, I want to say maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of about 90 days because what had happened was, and, and here's where, uh, and here's to me, here's what made all the difference in the world. When I initially contacted this lady, she said, listen, we need to like not do anything right now. We've got family members in the hospital and so on and so forth, but we do want to sell. Uh, at that very moment, every conversation that I had with her was about checking on her, her welfare, the person in the hospital, uh, you know, all of that stuff there. And so, because they wanted to sell, you know, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the issue at this mm -hmm. point, you know, but they had other issues that I felt just as a human being, probably needed more tending to, um, more care, more concern, more compassion than just getting the deal done. And I, and I think ultimately that's kind of what like just, you know, pushed everybody out of the way. Um, so then at that point. Um, I want to make a quick comment. Go ahead. So this is fundamentally what's called building rapport, okay? Um, now. Uh, that can be a very elusive term sometimes. It's kind of hard to understand um, how, what exactly do you need to do to build rapport, but it's very simple. Whenever you're communicating with the seller, it can be a buyer as well, uh, building rapport is building a connection to that individual. Building and strengthening the connection that you have with that individual. In this case, it was a seller. And if you listen to what Kenneth was saying, he basically, he knew that they wanted to sell that had already been established in the first conversation. 
but his primary, um, the primary focus of his conversations was about the seller, this lady, um, and her health in this situation because one of the main reasons she wanted to sell was given her failing health and her situation. And so he made that a priority to understand what was going on with her, her motivation, her problem, and see how he could help her. And this was just beyond selling the house, but just how he can help her and, and how um, he can make her life easier and smoother and better. And so by doing that, she built a connection with him. And so we had a whole bunch of hurdles to go over on this one, but because of the strength of the connection, um, she was working with us and we were able to work with her to make it happen. So I don't know where so, you left off, sorry. No, nah, so, and I, I mean, and then, you know, like I said, it just, uh, uh, when she got to a point where she says, okay, I'm ready to sell, my first question to her was, tell me what it is you would like to do. You know, you know, By the way, Hernando said that he just called 185 seller leads so he's got one of those are going to be a $39,000 sale. So he's coming after your ass, man. He's coming after you. You're going to hold that 39000 for long or what? Well, Actually, who's going to be the top dog? Because I think you, I don't, Marco, have you ever had a $39,000 lead uh -uh. sale? But actually, so he who's can taking look, over Hilco? Listen, he, can yeah. look, he can look over the, he can look at that thirty nine. Yeah. But hopefully uh, uh, sometime here soon, that might be a thing of the past. That it's 39? Yes. So it'll be 49 next time. I don't know. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's working on breaking his own records is what he's saying. I like it. <clears throat> so there might be another video soon is, is what he's referencing. He's got some competition. It's yeah. good. Didn't mean to interrupt. We just got some comments. Wanted to make sure we said hello to all the people joining us. We got 24 people and we only have about maybe 20 minutes left. So guys, yeah, make minutes. sure you ask your questions of Kenneth while you got Kenneth Godley. I love the last name. Kenneth is Godley and Marco is a Romero. Ask those guys how <laughs> they built this business. You know, how did he get that $39,000? One of the keys that I'm learning right now is the grit. Grit is the big thing. You just didn't give up and you were building rapport. So sorry, keep going. I love what you guys are saying. So uh, how did you all establish price? Was there a conversation about that, a negotiation about it? It sounds like she was pretty willing to sell. How did that come about? Well, basically, she was in a situation where uh, taxes were owed on the house. Uh, and again, with that first question, tell me exactly what it is that you want to do. And her question, I mean, her response was, I just want to get the taxes paid and I want to walk away with X amount of dollars. You know? And so, of course, how much are the taxes? She told me what they were. You know, the numbers made sense with what she wanted to walk away with. Uh, and so. Uh, Wasn't it like 14 grand in back taxes or something like that? 18. 18. Over 18. 18,000. Over 18. She thought it was 10. Uh, but after uh, I looked it up, I saw that it was, you know, it was 18. Uh, otherwise, that fee may have been even bigger. Mm -hmm. See, uh, this lead would have came up on a tax delinquent list, just FYI. So that's a, that can be an effective list. So um, she wanted to sell, you found out her situation, you were helpful in her situation, and then we got it under contract. Mm -hmm. Okay, after we got it under contract, uh, there's two next components. There's clearing title and there's finding a buyer. Let's first talk about finding a buyer. Was that easy, hard? Do we have somebody line up? What did that look like? Well, we had already had someone who was interested in it previously. From the first time we had From the first contract. contract. Okay. So I just called that person and said, hey, you know, here it is again, and, and he was very interested, and in, in, you know, so that part of it wasn't uh, uh, all that difficult. Um, That's a big component here when it comes, to, again, to reputation. The, when we originally had a contract and it fell through because of what we mentioned earlier, um, that buyer still wanted it. So our first phone call was to the previous buyer rather than trying to find another buyer or you know try and re-blast it at a higher fee or anything like that no hey this buyer was committed to us previously so let's give that person uh, I think it was a gentleman let's give that gentleman first rights at it so we can honor that and fulfill what we tried to do earlier so you want to kind of always follow through with your previous commitments even though it wasn't our fault it fell through the previous time so that was pretty easy. We had a contract in that place. And just to just to kind of uh, piggyback on what you were saying, that I contacted this gentleman at, in, to let, let's honor the deal that we had in place, mm -hmm. in the exact same price point that 
that we had agreed to, you know, in the first place. Even better. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we did that. So that part of it, like I said, it was, you know, it was fairly um, easy. So now let's talk about title. Now we got about 15 minutes left, and I know title was kind of a long story. <laughs> so uh, let's. What are some of the problems that or hurdles that we encountered, and then how did you handle solving those problems? Well, the main hurdle, of course, with clear <coughs> title. Uh, when you're talking about dealing with deceased persons or deceased persons who are, are listed on, on title uh, and getting all of the documentation um, associated with that, um, there was the deceased, there were uh, several children who all were deceased and we just Who was deceased? Was it like her husband or? The, well, both parents were deceased as long and she had three other siblings, all of whom were deceased. So the parents were the ones that were originally entitled? So it was actually just the mother who was originally entitled. Ah, okay. And mom was the only one who was originally entitled. Uh, and so once, I mean, we had to go through uh, getting affidavits of airship, um, and I mean, just I mean, just a whole bunch of the getting death certificates and you know all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I basically had to, because this lady, she has her own health issues, I basically had to go and just that did a lot of running around, you know, just to try to help them, you know, get this deal done. Did you call it driving Miss Daisy? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the so I want to go over the title a little bit. So the mother was originally entitled. Mm -hmm. She died. Right. And w there wasn't a will. There was no will. Okay. So because of that, I. I don't know the technicalities of it, um, but I think what really happens is like 50% goes to the kids and 50% goes to the husband, but the husband died too, right? Mm -hmm. So then all the ownership rights would have gone to the kids. Mm -hmm. And you said there was a total of four children? Yes. And the seller uh, was only one still alive? Yes. So then there was three deceased siblings? Yes. So for the mother, what do we have to get for her? Uh, we had to get the death certificate as well as an affidavit of airship. Okay. Uh, which, by the way, most of the information that we requested, the sellers had. Uh, that makes it a lot easier. So that, that makes it so much easier. Uh, but the things that they didn't have, I mean, it was a challenge in getting them. But mm -hmm. I mean, you know, but we what, got them. Uh, really quick description. What's an affidavit of airship? Like, what's the purpose of it? Uh, the purpose of an affidavit of airship is to establish who is rightfully entitled uh, to make a transaction on the, on the property. Um, right. Who would have received like ownership rights? <laughs> and you had to have two people to sign it. You have to have two people to sign it. Two disinterested parties, uh, who will, who will. Uh, so family don't work. So family don't. It does in some cases because on a previous one that I did, uh, it was a family member, but they had already established precedent by signing other legal documents that were related to uh, uh, the deceased parties well before this property even came up. And, okay. and, and again, those sellers, they had record of this also. So typically, typically like neighbors no. are really good, family, friend, those type of things. And mm -hmm. they're basically signing, stating, <clears throat> yes, the mother died and she would have given ownership to the daughter in this scenario. Actually, it, it, it doesn't even say that much. It's just saying that I, I've known these fam this family for over 10 years and everything that they're telling you is correct. Uh, okay. So. Okay. And keep in mind, so this is why I want to tag uh, Dee Dee in here. Let's let's put Dee Dee. I'll put her in. Okay, put her in there for Dee -Dee? me. Dee Dee. Dee uh, Dee Jackson. Jackson. She has a middle name. I forget what it is. Uh, this is why having a title company that you work with and is knowledgeable about investment deals is very powerful and useful and helpful. Excellent. We're gonna tag Dee Dee in here. So this is a shout out to Dee Dee. She works at Alamo Title. Alamo Title is where we do a lot of our transactions. We do business all over, but Alamo is our primary. And um, as we were going through this process, it wasn't just us figuring out everything. Yes, we were very involved, but we were highly reliant on the title company to tell us, okay, what's our current problem or what are our problems in general and what's the first thing we need to work on? Okay, we need to get a death certificate for this person. We need to get an affidavit affidavit of airship for these three people or whatever it is and then we had kind of an action plan to work on it but if you don't converse with your title company and they aren't telling you what's going on you're going to be lost so you need to be working with a title company that's going to tell you hey this 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 and this I need you to get this now 
that's basically how it handled. We we handed them a bunch of stuff, then they said, okay, let's review it. Okay, now you need to get this, this, and this, and then we handed them the next bunch of stuff, and then we that's how we orchestrated it, right? That's pretty much how it went. I made uh, uh, several trips uh, out there um, it, because in most of these deals, you know, time is of the essence, and in this case, it was just better for uh, everyone involved that for me to actually hand deliver uh, most of these documents to the title company. Yeah, you didn't want to take any chances. So what we got over there? Well, well, I'm just saying that this is the last about four minutes you have to ask Kenneth how he got the magic fingers to get these phone numbers and all the crazy stuff he did to close this $39,000 deal. So you have about four minutes, and then we're going to wrap it up. So this is your last chance. Okay. Right. So uh, all the while, we this took a long time. Mm -hmm. So we had to extend our closing dates with the seller and the buyer. Mm -hmm. The seller w was working with us. With the buyer, you were setting proper expectations, letting them know what was going on. What did that conversation go like? Well, and I mean, it was everybody was you know cooperative. The the thing of it was is open communication with all parties involved. Um, the and I just want to give credit to the buyers. Uh, they were, you know, patient. Um, as as I said before, the lady had a lot of health issues, so uh, just because of her appointments and things like that, it slowed things down tremendously. Uh, but the buyers, you know, they were uh, more than you know gracious, and and, and you know they just kind of just everybody just worked together, um, even in those uh, tense moments where people are anxious about getting this thing closed. And you have to continuously uh, set proper expectations. You have to kind of reframe things uh, uh, just so people can just get a different look and, it, you know, just kind of keep everybody, you know, flowing and, and just working in concert together. Uh, we have a quick question here. Matt Smith said, did you get the death certificate or the title company? We, we got the death certificates. Uh, we actually went to, I actually went to the uh, vital records office with uh, the seller uh, and they were having some financial challenges and so, uh, you know, we actually paid for it. Hillco Homes actually paid for that death certificate. So, um, actually, um, the title company does do a lot of work and um, it's helpful when they do that. You want to be working with the title company that will actually do these certain things. But our mentality as Hilka Homes uh, in general and Kent's mentality is this is our contract, this is our transaction, even though in a lot of cases it may not be your job, it, you know, you're paying the title company to do this, you're paying, you know, a real estate agent supposed to be doing this. We take full ownership of our contracts and we'll do whatever it takes to get, move the deal forward, even if it's taking the responsibility of other individuals. So maintain that mentality when you're doing your own deals. Um, so, uh, and then give it another quick example of like how you went above and beyond to make certain things happen. Like I knew one of the challenges we had was getting, a, it was a death certificate, right, mm -hmm. at the uh, Vital Statistics office and you physically went down there yourself to try and procure them, but mm -hmm. that didn't work because uh, they have a certain they, list. They have a certain list of, you know, who's authorized to get them. Uh, and so then, I mean, just another uh, challenge that, the uh, sellers, they didn't have exact dates, and I mean, it, they, it was just, I mean, I, I guess there were many challenges, but it really wasn't that difficult. I mean, it was just a lot of uh, simple stuff, and, and it, it just, you know, it was kind of tedious, uh, but it needed to be done, you know, and, and like you said, it, you know, it's our contract, uh, you know, this is our fee, hey, this is $39,000 at the end of the day, you know, so we needed to, you know, do whatever needed to be done. Um, you had even coordinated for a taxi, mm -hmm. a special taxi because she's in a wheelchair, right? Right. Uh, a taxi that could co accommodate a wheelchair to go pick her up, take her down uh, to the uh, vital statistics office. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, she had complications and wasn't able to make that. And then you even drove her yourself personally, right? I, she, I drove her daughter. Drove her daughter, because yes. she Because she couldn't transfer it to my car, otherwise we would have... That would have sure, been done sure. early in the game. So basically, you did whatever it took. You drove whoever you needed to take. You or orchestrated taxis. You made phone calls. You orchestrated. You worked around their schedule, which was you know very limited pockets mm -hmm. uh, due to her health, those type of things. So you basically did whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. 
And then and and just the part of you know building the relationships because to me now we're past rapport. <laughs> we're, we're we're building a, we built a relationship now. But when it was all over, she said, "Can he bring me my check? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he's my brother now." <laughs> so. All right, so uh, we're going to be wrapping up here soon, but I think we got another comment or question here. Yeah, so Michael DeHaven asked, will a title company check on a title before it's under contract? And I think this will have to be our last question. Last question. So I'm glad we finished with you, Mike. Uh, title companies will not give a full title check um, prior to being under contract, but they can do some general checks. If you just reach out to a title company, hey, can you do quick review of this particular property, especially if you establish a, re a relationship with them. Uh, they won't go down to their title plants and do the extensive, uh, so it won't be 100%, but it can give you a general idea. A lot of people do this prior to the foreclosure auctions. They'll target a handful of properties and then they'll ask the title company, can you just do a general check on this uh, or on these properties that have an idea of um, you know what could be on the title of those properties. So yes, but also no. All right, so Kenneth, we've tagged him uh, personally. You can reach out to him He's if you have any particular questions. If you have questions about this deal, put them in the comment section below or to the side, and we will answer those questions for you. We want to give you true, real feedback. There is even way more into the story we didn't even go to, but bottom line is don't give up. Do whatever it takes. The hardest deals are usually the ones you can um, that are the most lucrative. Be persistent. Don't take no as an answer. Always be thinking about how can you accomplish it? How can you make it work? What can you do to get to a solution? Do you have any final parting words? Uh, every day is a day to make magic. And I mean, this, this is fun. I mean, this is, this is not work. It, it really isn't. So I mean, just, hey, anything we can do to help you guys, uh, by all means, feel free to just, as Marco said, uh, Put your comments in and, and uh, let's go make some magic. That's right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Enjoy your day.